Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. I'm Amber Harper from the Burned In Teacher Podcast and a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, Edgy Magicians, and welcome back to another episode of the Edgy Magic Podcast. My name is Dr. Sam Fesich, and today I have with me Brandy Rosen. We met over on Instagram and possibly Twitter. I feel like our social media connects us everywhere we go. And Brandy is an amazing resource for special education tips, tricks, especially when it comes to that paperwork, getting it all untangled. So Brandy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have you on because this is one of the episodes that's going to be in our special education series. And before we get into all things IEP and data tracking and all those good fun things, I would love for you to share your teaching journey, your teaching story. Okay. Um, Well, I've been in special education for nearly 30 years, which is, you know, kind of shocking. Um, And I started out, um, I actually came through education a little bit differently. I started out as a social worker. And um, after spending some time working with kids in the social work setting, I realized that I wanted to do things a little bit differently. And so I went back to school and started teaching students with emotional and behavioral disorders um, in more of a self-contained classroom. And that's where I started, loved every minute of it. Um, still, you know, some of the best years of teaching for me. And then um, throughout the years, I moved into working um, uh, with a a fair amount of kids with autism. I moved into um, the world of behavior. And so I spent some time um, developing and and, um, supporting programs in the world of uh, behavior support. And um, and then um, eventually I moved into training teachers and mentoring teachers, um, primarily new teachers in kind of the areas of IEPs, um, classroom management, behavior support, um, you know, those kind of areas. But really um, what I consider sort of the core of what special education teachers need um, to be able to run a really successful classroom. And then um, I also um, have been doing a fair amount of training for general ed teachers in setting up um, behavior systems and classroom management systems in the general ed setting and kind of how to take that information and move that into a more general ed setting. So, uh, you know, kind of all over the place, but it's been wonderful. I've loved every, you know, really every, every experience I've had in education. You, you do have lots of different experiences, but everywhere you've been, you've been serving the people around you from the students to the new teachers, to the gen ed teachers, which is fantastic, Brandy. Well, thank you. It, it is, it has been you know, rewarding and fun. And, and I do have to say, you know, moving into working with um, new teachers, you start to see how the impact that has and the importance of that, um, you know, especially in special education, where we do, you know, tend to have a high turnover rate. um, Mm -hmm. You just really can see that the more support that um, new teachers have at the beginning, the more successful and happy they are as they move through. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I'm so glad new teachers have you out there supporting them when it comes to special education. And one of the topics we are talking about today is the IEP. So we're going to break it down. Brandy, can you share what exactly is an IEP? What can we find in there? And what's some information as new teachers or as student teachers who are going into like long-term placements this fall? What are some things they should be aware of when they're looking at the IEP? That's a great question and really an important one. Um, I one of the one of the areas that we've been focusing on a little bit um, has been making sure that new um, teachers at, during their student teaching experience really get a good handle and a good experience on IEPs because, um, like you said, you know it really is kind of the heart and soul of being a special education teacher and it can 
it can really make or break a year. And so um, I think as student teachers are moving into their placements and um, working with their teachers, it's really, really important that they are able to um, have a lot of experience both reading, writing, and being a part of IEP meetings because um, it's definitely one of those areas where just reading it out of a book makes it hard once you're, you know, in the moment. I, I Every single teacher I think I've ever worked with has said, wow, that's really different than it was when I read it. <laughs> um, yes. So um, we, uh, you know, I do a lot of training with um, veteran teachers on how to support new teachers coming in. And one of them is first, you know, there's a, there's about three areas that I think are really critical. The first is understanding the structure of an IEP and really what the important areas are. And so when I work with teachers, I, I explain that um, a good IEP is like a connect the dots game, right? And so um, one part needs to go into the other. And if it, if it doesn't go in order, if it doesn't, if it kind of goes off tier, you're not going to get that picture that you were looking for. So the, you know, the entire IEP is important. Um, and, you know, you had asked what, what is an IEP? So I should probably back up there. Um, and an IEP is an individualized education plan. And it's a, it's a document that is, um, that was created by federal law. And basically what it is, it's a, it, it's a, um, it's a document that is each individual student's kind of learning plan. And that's, that's kind of, I think, the best way to think about it. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. mean, you know, it doesn't mean that, that kids with IEPs aren't learning all the other things that are going on in schools. It means that for this particular student, this IEP really focuses on the areas that they need more or different kind of learning. And so um, the document is um, created with a team, the IEP team, and it is individualized for each student. There should never, you know, we like to say you should never see two IEPs that are exactly the same because there are no mm -hmm. two students that are exactly the same. And so um, when I when I talk about a connect the dots process, though, what I mean is that the, the beginning of an IEP, you talk about a student's present levels, and that's really where they're where they are right now. And we look at all the areas of potential um, needs and, and all the areas that students learn in. And so we start with those present levels, and that's where we gather all of our information. We talk about where is this student right now? Um, and so that is really the base of the program because that's where the student is. So then we move from there. That guides us into the IEP goals, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute. <laughs> the goals are really what do we want for that student to be able to do in a year's time generally. And, but again, that's based on the present levels. And so it's not going to look the same for two different students because they're going to have two different present levels. And so those IEP goals are really the meat and potatoes of the IEP. They're, they're really what we're going to be focusing yeah. on for that student. And then once we have that, the next dot is really the services and placement. And, and there's a lot of other things that go in between that. But if we're talking about really kind of those key areas to talk about, um, those three sort of guide a student's program. And the services or placement are, services and placement are what are we going to provide for that student to assure the best that we can that they are going to make progress on those goals that we decided they need. Um, and so that's really what that IEP is. And um, I'm kind of like an IEP nerd and I, I think they're really important. And I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they're just like a paper to go into a file. I think they really help us. Um, and so they're worth taking the time to do, um, to do well, but they do take a lot of time at the beginning. And um, it is one of the main areas that I support teachers in is how to do it well, but not take up, you know, hours and hours of your time. And, and a lot of that is about, you know, planning things from the beginning of the year, not trying to do it all at once, all of that. Just like, you know, any teacher kind of spreading that out over time. So yeah. that's, that's really what an IEP is. There are different kinds of IEPs. There's, you know, initials when a student is going into special education. There are annuals, which are held once a year. There are triannuals. So there's a whole, you know, there's kind of a whole spectrum of that. And so, um, I really encourage student teachers to talk to their teachers, to ask to be able to see the IEP, to really go through them and ask questions, you know, so they understand it, be a part of writing it. That's that's the best yeah, experience. Yeah. 
the best experience is to be able to be a part of writing it and to be able to attend the meetings. Because if not, you're walking in just so cold and you haven't done any of that. It makes it really hard. Brandy, I love that idea as a student teacher, not only just reading reading through the IEP, but also if you can help and like with um, writing it, see if you can add some some strengths, some areas of need to that IEP, um, and then also attending that meeting and seeing how the group and the team works collaboratively and works together for the success of that student. That is going to help you so much when you start that first year of teaching. I love that strategy. Oh, it, it really makes such a difference. And, and I think that it's, you know, it's about building confidence too. It's, it's very hard for a brand new teacher to, um, you know, feel confident if they've never actually even written an IEP or sat in an IEP. And then we expect them on day one to jump in and do it. I just don't, I don't think that's a realistic expectation. You know, I think that that really puts them, it, it just makes it much harder than it needs to be. So, Brandy, I have another question following up for our student teachers. When they're looking at those IEPs, and we know that those documents can be very long, they can be very cumbersome, what are some key things they should be maybe documenting, you know, um, you know, protecting the child's privacy, changing their name and everything, but what are some things they should be documenting? So maybe they're looking really quick in their student teacher binder as they're planning their lessons. What adaptations do I need to make to this lesson so I can support my students? Are there any certain little areas? areas that they should be looking at and maybe taking note of some things that their students need to help support them in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. So there's another section of the IEP called the accommodation section, the accommodations and modification section. Um, and w so if the goals of the IEP are what do we want the student to be able to do, the accommodations and the modifications are what are we going to put in place while the student is mastering those goals. So they're really, the accommodations and the modifications are what we are doing. The IEP goals are really what the student is going to be doing. Um, and so when a student teacher is developing a lesson, especially, well, I mean, really even a general ed student teacher or a special ed student teacher, because um, even if it's a general ed uh, student teacher, they're going to need to be aware of a student's IEPs and what accommodations are in place as well if they're creating those lessons. Mm -hmm. um, and so those accommodations are the area that really kind of define what um, what is going to be done differently. So let's say you're um, you are um, designing a, a writing lesson, and for um, the students, the expectation is they're going to write three paragraphs on a topic or something. And then for a student with an IEP, in their accommodation section, it may say that they um, work collaboratively with a teacher to design a graphic organizer before the writing assignment happens. And so then that would be important for you to know as a student teacher that that piece needs to be in place. And, yeah. and so then you might think, well, you know what, let's do a graphic organizer with everybody because that's a great class activity. Mm -hmm. And then, right, and then you've then met the needs of that, uh, that particular student without kind of having to pull them out. Um, you know, there may be accommodations that they have to do less of the assignment, like maybe every other problem. It might be that they get extra time or they need their, um, you know, they need their assignments to be bigger or less, less numbers on a page. You know, there's all different kinds of things that can be um, accommodated for. And so um, that's really an, a, an important area and a, and a really, um, you know, um, quote unquote, easy area for a student teacher to kind of get in there and get some practice doing some things a little bit differently. I love that. Thank you so much, Brandy. So we talked about what an IEP was, what are some main areas we can find in an IEP, some things to look for student teachers when you're flipping through that IEP and reading it for your students because you want to meet the needs of the students in your class. But one of the big areas, and you know, we kind of alluded to it earlier, is an IEP goal. Now, there are short-term, there are long-term, there is benchmarking, there's lots of terms within IEP goals as well. Uh, Brainy, would you mind expanding upon those different areas and what do we need to have to have a great IEP goal that's measurable and that we can observe, all those good things that we need to have in an IEP goal? So this is one of my favorite areas, <laughs> and it, it, <laughs> Yay! It's, it's kind of weird that it is, um, but... Um, because it's so important, I think that it's worth spending a little bit of time learning what what's right and why it's important. 
that's that's the other piece. So a lot of times um, in the world of special education, because there's so much paperwork, people start to feel like it's all just paperwork. It's all not important because it's just paperwork. It's not what we really need. And some of that is true. Some of that is true that there's a lot of paperwork. But for IEP goals, it actually is important to be as specific and clear as you can, because this is what is going to guide the, the teacher's learning. And it may be you, it may be a different teacher next year, it may be other people. So you want to make sure that goal is really, really understandable. And so I use, um, with the with the teachers that I train, I use what I call the rainbow method. And um, mm-hmm. and I will absolutely share that out. I, I, I believe that maybe I did. And you can share that with um, your listeners. And the reason I developed this method is for, for exactly the reason you asked why, what needs to be in every goal. And it can get confusing and you can forget parts because there's just a lot to it. So for each and every goal, and this is based on both state and federal laws, um, what's, what needs to be included in an IEP. Um, they don't say exactly how you have to write it, but you do need to include these pieces. And so um, you need to include the date that it's going to be met by. Generally, that's going to be a year from the time it's written. Not always, depending on the situation. Um, you, you need to include where are you expecting this goal to be met. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the only place you're going to teach the goal. It just means when you're taking data, that's where you expect it to be met. And this is an area that a lot of times um, people forget about and and don't, you know, kind of focus on. But it can be in a small group setting. It can be a large group setting. It can be one-to-one. It can be on the playground. It can be all over campus. That just depends on what the needs of the student, you know, are. Um, and then you're going to have the the um, the actual skill that you're going to be working on. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what most people see when they, you know, when they when they see a goal. And then you're going to have, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of um, data measurement pieces. It's going to be um, your accuracy, your duration, and how you're going to collect that data, which is a lot of language, you know, that becomes a little bit overwhelming, but that's not the most critical piece for new teachers to learn right from the beginning. Um, But if you use, and and the reason I made it the rainbow method is because then you just have this structure in place, you know that all these colors need to be covered. And if you forgot one, then you can come back and you can fill that in. Um, And really what's, what's super important about IEP goals is you want it to be as specific as you can be so that, um, so that the goals are easily measurable and you're really looking at the skill that you want and that no matter who is looking at the goal, they know exactly what you're looking for. When I started, when I started teaching, I used to um, <clears throat> give my husband the IEP goals I was writing who is not in education and I would say, do you know what I'm asking? And if he said no, then I knew I wasn't being specific enough because you want anybody that reads the goal to know what it is. Um, Like, for example, you know, instead of saying, you know, Johnny will be a good student all day, right? Because that can mean a million different things. Yeah. (laughs) Right. You're, you're going to want to say what the skill is you're looking at. Johnny will attend to a teacher directed lesson or something, you know, so that you know exactly what you're looking for. And friends, just a reminder, this will be in the show notes. You will have access to this uh, freebie that Brandy will share with us with the, um, I think you called it the rainbow goal? The rainbow method, yeah. The rainbow method, yes. And I I love that. It was just so, it's very strategic and it's very formulaic when it comes to writing that IEP goal because we want to make sure it's clear and direct and that we know what we're looking for. We know what we're not looking for, you know, being able to focus in on that. Thank you. And when it comes to writing those IEP goals, a big part of that is taking the data. And I know some of our students and future teachers out there is like, oh, no, she said the four-letter word data, data. Now, data doesn't have to be hard, right? What What are some tips and strategies that you have when it comes to tracking data and what kind of data can we be taking? Yes. Um, you know, I call it the D word because that's how everybody feels about it. But I swear it does not have to be complicated. I, you know, I spent a lot of time in the world of behavior where we use a lot of complicated data, but we don't need to do that. That That is not what we're looking for. So I always, you know, try to... Um, let teachers know from the beginning, just take a breath. We're not looking for that complicated data. And the reality is 
we don't need that. And sometimes it's even, it in, even interferes with our information if we try to make it too complicated. So my tips are, and this is my, you know, this is, I'm convinced this is the, the most important thing. I tell all new teachers at the beginning of every school year, before the kids are even there, I schedule, depending on how big my caseload is, one to two data collection days a month. And during those, what I've scheduled in during um, the school year, I don't, I, no matter what, I keep those data collection days. I don't let those get pushed away. And and how you collect that data will depend on kind of what your settings like. You might, you know, push into classes. You might have kids come out. But during those mm-hmm. days, that is when you're collecting data on the goals. So first off, the scheduling is a huge part because, um, immediately people get overwhelmed and they're like, I don't have time. I, how can I possibly do it? Which I, which is all, which are all real concerns because it's very, very busy. But if you schedule it in, then you've got that on your calendar already. So that's, that's a really, um, that's a big tip that I recommend everybody do. And then as far as data collection, the easiest way to do it is to take the IEP goals to create very simple data collection systems. Like I, I, um, I use basically, you know, where I write the goals on one side, there's dates and there's boxes and it's, you know, met or not met because that's all you really need for most of the goals that you're writing. And I'm going to come back to the idea of the goals. The more, the better the goals are, the more clear the goals are, the easier the data collection is. And, um, uh, it's it's kind of a back and forth conversation. So if you're really struggling with writing, with creating data forms, I I will say to teachers, let's go back and look at the goals. And next time we may want to do those a little bit differently so we can collect data easier. Um, and then I create, so, you know, I'm old and I create um, data, you know, data folders for my kids because I still like it on paper. Now, not everybody does. And everything that I kind of offer is both, you know, online accessible and on paper because I understand that a lot of people like that, but I like paper. And so I just print out the IEP goals. I print out the data sheets and then whoever is working with that student, whether it be me, assistants, you know, student teachers, they are able to then take that data on those data collection days. And it's super easy. So then when you get to the time that you need to be writing goals again or reviewing that IEP, you have it all with you. And you're not trying to scramble and go back and get all of this information, which is what can be super yeah. overwhelming for teachers. Yeah. That was awesome. That was Ooh. really actionable. And you know what? I think data can be delightful, Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, but I also am very understanding that not everybody enjoys it quite that much. Um, <laughs> but I think that um, data is data is one of those things that is overwhelming if you haven't done the other things first. Mm-hmm. If you have, it becomes less overwhelming. And that's, you know, when I sit down with new teachers, I say, like, if we're at a point and they're sort of frantic, uh, it's, it's a good lesson. And that's how we talk about it. It's like, okay, well, next mm-hmm. time we're going to do this differently so that we're not at this point. And, you, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of find your groove in, in what works for you. Brittany, this has been amazing sharing about what IEPs are, some nitty gritties about what we can find in there, how to write an IEP goal using the rainbow method. Great name, by the way. Absolutely <laughs> love that. Um, how to track data. So it's it's not so hard and it doesn't become this thing that we get anxious and worried about. It's something, you know, it just becomes part of our routine because we've already done those best practices right. for writing goals and how are we going to track them? We've already done that. So it makes it easier. Right. I, I know you've already shared so many tips for any, but I have to ask you, do you have any more tips for our student teachers who are going into their special education placements this fall uh, when it comes to student teaching? Um, well, I think, you know, a couple things. Um, I think be, know that it's going to be a lot and kind of confusing and don't worry about that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure that's, you know, what you talk with all teachers about, but special ed is you're walking in and I mean, even from the beginning, you might not even know the language that they're using and, and the systems they're using and that's okay. So I would say as I think it is with all settings, it's really, really important to take a minute to build those relationships with both the staff 
and the students that you're working with. Um, because, you know, sometimes there's a lot of high intensity in the classrooms and there's a lot going on. Um, and then I would say, be as open and um, willing to do whatever the special ed teacher is asking you to, because each and every piece of being a special ed teacher is really important. And though it may not seem, you know, like what was in your thought of what you'd be doing, when you're a special ed teacher, you're going to have to be doing all of those things. And so any experience that you have it is going to be super helpful for you. Anything that you are able to be comfortable enough with that you're um, ready to jump in when you have your own classroom will be super, super helpful. And, um, and you know what? Talk to the assistants in the classroom. Talk to other people because everybody has their own experience within special ed and everybody brings their own area of expertise. And so it's great to know. I mean, sometimes the assistants in the classroom have been there for 15, 20 years and they have a lot of really great information as well. So um, and like I said, you know, to to kind of circle back to the beginning, um, really, really try and get in there and help with writing the IEPs and yeah. running those IEPs because that that is just going to be so helpful for you. It really is. And it, guys, if you don't get anything out of this, up, if you don't get anything but that, that is gold right there. If you can hop in on an IEP meeting, if you can help to write that IEP, I know you're not a certified teacher, but if you can brainstorm some ideas with the educator, that is gold that is awesome you're already a step ahead you know as you're as a new teacher absolutely i love it brandy thank you so much for your time today and before we end our conversation can you please share my listeners can get in touch with you absolutely um and thank you so much it's really been a pleasure um you can reach me really through email is probably the easiest at brandy rosen consulting at gmail.com um and um i also have a website that you're welcome to go to where a lot of the resources that um that we talked about are shared but also other things if you want to pop in and that's at um learn to teach with brandy.com so um yeah, if you reach out in any of those places, I'm happy to chat and I'm always happy to just jump on a call or, you know, answer questions through email as well. Wonderful. Thank you. And friends, all those links will be down in the show notes. So just scroll down and you can find all of Brandy's contact info there. Thanks again, Brandy. This was awesome. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. there you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more Edu Magic, check out sfesich.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesich. Until next time, you have the Edu Magic within you.